Are you seeing high iron levels on your blood test and wondering if you might have hemochromatosis? Maybe you already think you have hemochromatosis and want a little more information as far as genetics and some of the things that could be going on in your body. My name is Dr. Taranella, and in this video, we're going to look at hemochromatosis, what you need to know about it, how prevalent it is, some of the genetics behind it, and what's actually happening in your body when you have hereditary hemochromatosis. Again, my name is Dr. Taranella, and if you're new to this channel, I just want you to know that I'm making these videos to help you go beyond the basics of your health, whether it's a confusing lab test, symptom, or diagnosis. Make these videos to help you get a better understanding of what's going on with your health. So if you like this kind of information on nutrition, hormones, vitamin levels, etc., click on the like button and don't forget to subscribe to the channel to get more videos like this one. Now for a quick disclaim, the information contained in this video is for informational purposes only. It's not intended as treatment for any medical condition or a substitute for seeing an actual doctor or medical professional. It should be used as an educational guide to deepen your understanding of your own health and treatment success. If medical attention is needed, don't delay in seeking that attention. All right, let's look at this topic on hereditary hemochromatosis. So in this video, we're going to look more specifically at hereditary hemochromatosis and why it's important and how it kind of fits into other high iron situations that you might encounter. As mentioned in previous videos, hereditary hemochromatosis is a genetic disorder that is characterized by excessive or increased absorption and accumulation of iron. This genetic condition is very prevalent and it occurs in approximately one in every 200 to one in every 400 individuals. So it's one of the more common genetic disorders. The prevalence is even higher in specific subpopulations like those with Northern European ancestry. So with this condition, you have increased iron absorption from the diet and it leads to accumulation or building up of that iron in your body in specific tissues, which is where the problems come from. So let's talk a little bit about the genetics of hemochromatosis and then we're going to go into some more of the mechanistic problems or reasons that iron starts to accumulate from this genetic disorder. So from a genetic standpoint, hereditary hemochromatosis occurs or is caused by a mutation in the HFE gene. There are two specific mutations that account for most of hereditary hemochromatosis, and that is a mutation at the C282Y and the H. 63D. These two mutations will disrupt the normal regulatory process for iron absorption by affecting the interaction of the HFE protein with other proteins involved in the absorption of iron. So what does this mean? Well, normal processes, the HFE protein interacts with another protein called the transferrin receptor. That interaction is what is regulating the amount of iron absorbed from the diet. So mutations in the HFE protein lead to an increased iron absorption from the intestines, which results in an accumulation of excess iron in your body, and then eventually into specific tissues like liver, sometimes joints, pancreas, and other organs. While we're on the topic of genetics, there are other genetic alterations that that can lead to problems with iron metabolism and increased iron absorption. So in particular, in mutations in the gene that codes for the protein for hepcidin or also hemojuvalin, both of these are associated with certain types of hemochromatosis. So I wanted to go into a little more detail on what's happening with this HFE protein with hemochromatosis. So again, when normally functioning, the HFE protein interacts with the transferrin receptor protein. That interaction helps regulate the absorption of iron by influencing the amount of hepcidin that's being produced. Normally what happens is the HFE protein binds to the transferrin receptor, and once that's bound, it starts to circulate in the blood, and then that particular protein can then associate with the transferrin molecule that's also bound to iron. And that whole complex is thought to be behind what regulates production of hepcidin. The hepcidin production is happening in the liver, so that whole complex is interacting with the liver and regulating the amount of hepcidin that's being produced. Now, if you remember from previous video, hepcidin actually reduces the amount of iron absorption that's occurring. So if you have some sort of 
problem with the HFE protein, you're going to have some abnormal responses either at the place where the HFE protein is binding to the transferrin receptor or the whole complex as it interacts with the transferrin bound iron or as the whole complex interacts with the liver. Some part of that chain reaction is getting disrupted and you're getting less hepcidin production from the liver leading to no regulation of the iron absorption. So just kind of free floating in more regular than it would if the hepcidin was present at normal amounts. So hepcidin acts like a negative feedback for the absorption of iron coming in through the intestines, but it also reduces or inhibits the release of iron from specific cells that generally store the iron like macrophages and hepatocytes. So these genetic mutations in that HFE gene, the C282Y and H63D are altering how well that HFE protein is being produced. And so it creates a chain reaction of reduced hepcidin production and the ability for your body to regulate iron absorption is very compromised as a result of that. So individuals with hereditary hemochromatosis accumulating higher amounts of iron than their bodies actually need. And with that, the body will start depositing that iron in different tissues and organs, predominantly liver, heart, pancreas, and your joints. Over time, that iron accumulation in those tissues leads to dysfunction or problems in those tissues. So it's usually a homozygous patient in those two specific genes that lead to hereditary hemochromatosis. But what happens if you only have heterozygous patient? Do you still end up with changes in your hepcidin levels and do you end up with high iron levels? The answer to that is it depends which gene. And so we'll get into that. But first of all, homozygous versus heterozygous. So homozygous means you got one altered copy from both parents, meaning you have two altered copies. So they're the same homo in the fact that they're both altered. Heterozygous means one's normal, one's altered. So if you have heterozygous of the C282Y, generally that's still going to result in some hemochromatosis. But it's not clear if the H63D heterozygous will still end up with hemochromatosis. In fact, even those with homozygous H63D may not result in hemochromatosis. Some studies show that the resulting hemochromatosis outcome where there's increased iron absorption with the H63D is actually fairly low. I'll put a link to a paper that actually looks at that in particular in the description. Still, I think with alterations in the H63D, more than likely you're going to end up with slightly higher iron absorption than not. It may result in a mild form of hemochromatosis or increased iron absorption. We still need to be aware of the possibility of that causing problems. There may be other genetic alterations associated with decreased hepcidin production. So it could be coming from different angles where you end up with decreased hepcidin production leading to more iron accumulation. And of course, there's lifestyle factors too. I'll leave the more detailed discussion on all the genetic variabilities for another video. Certainly, if that's something you want to see, drop it in the comment section and I'll be sure to create a video on that topic. So the diagnosis for hereditary hemochromatosis is usually going to be a combination of blood tests, genetic tests, and maybe even some imaging. The blood tests are usually going to be a ferritin and transferrin saturation and possibly looking at red blood cells as well. So again, as that transferrin saturation goes up beyond 40-50%, that's when you're more likely to have a problem with this. Now, of course, if you eat a lot of things that are rich in iron, like red meat on a regular basis, that will increase your iron saturation. So if you get a, a test that's really high, you definitely want to have more than one test done before you assume you have this problem. But of course, you don't want to ignore it either. And getting the genetic testing and getting ahead of this early on is really important as that accumulation of iron in your tissues can be something that's happening. And the longer that's going on, the more likely you're going to have long-term problems from this. The primary treatment for hereditary hemochromatosis is to 
donate blood. And sometimes it needs to be done more frequently than what the traditional blood donation centers would allow you to do. A lot of times it does, especially initially. And so you need a doctor's order to kind of bypass their normal algorithm for allowing you to donate blood. In addition to the therapeutic blood draws, you also want to be being obviously be more mindful of the amount of iron you're consuming in your diet and avoid vitamin C supplements that are going to naturally enhance that absorption. So obviously this is going to be mostly red meats and other animal-based products are what's going to contain the iron, the heme iron or iron from blood from animals is going to be much more absorbable and bioavailable than plant-based irons. So in addition with that high iron saturation that you're probably carrying around on a regular basis, we usually would recommend using some kind of antioxidant non-vitamin C antioxidant therapy. And I'll put a link in the description to some that you can consider if this is a problem going on with you. Of course, very important that you get this under control through the proper guidance of a hematologist or doctor that understands what's going on with your high iron and follows it on a regular basis. Doing too many blood donations obviously can be just as much as a problem as too little blood donations and iron accumulation. So how'd I do? Did that help you better understand hemochromatosis, why it's important, and some of the variables around hemochromatosis and its genetic origins? Hopefully that does. If you want to see more information on hemochromatosis or you have a follow-up question on this particular video, drop it in the comment section. Happy to answer your question. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.